Well, um, good afternoon. Uh, hello. So I'm, I'm Representative Dave Pinto. I'm the chair of the House Committee on Children and Families, Finance, and Policy, and I am so excited to be with everybody today to talk about two bills that will be on the House floor. Um, every child in Minnesota deserves a great start. We know that we all benefit when that happens. Um, child care and early learning is a sector that uh, was in crisis even before the pandemic, and of course then the pandemic made things even worse. So the two bills that uh, we are taking up on the House floor today demonstrate uh, our commitment um, as a caucus and really as, um, as a government to say that we need to stabilize the sector in the short run and to make investments um, that really get kids off to that great start that they deserve in the long run. So House File 150, uh, one of the bills is um, a bill that has uh, that is all about before July 1, before the next budget kicks in, $40 million in early learning scholarships. Hello. <laughs> right on. Um, in $40 million in early learning scholarships to help approximately 4,000 families get the child care and early learning that they need and deserve right now. It also has funding uh, to stabilize, to, to continue the monthly payments that providers have been receiving um, to stabilize them and make sure those payments don't drop as they're scheduled to do so in March. So that's the one bill. Um, the second bill, House File 13, is one that achieves a goal that we've been working for a number of years to achieve, which is to meet the federal standard for the child care assistance program, to say that we will pay the 75th percentile of rates to providers um, to make sure that we are maximizing the use of funds uh, to make sure that as many young, many kids as possible and families as possible are receiving the support that they need and, again, that they deserve. We've got a couple of uh, folks here who are going to share um, their experiences. I am going to call up, uh, first things first, uh, Amanda Schillinger, who's going to talk with you about her experience um, as uh, somebody working in child care and early learning. So, Amanda, yeah. come on up. Hi, everyone. I'm Amanda Schillinger, and I have been the director at Pumpkin Patch Child Care and Learning Centers in Burnsville for the past 20 years, and I'm also a leader with Kids Count on Us. I stood at this exact podium nearly a year ago, urging the legislature to increase the child care assistance reimbursement rates to the 75th percentile. And I'm so excited to be back here today as the, vote pre as the House votes to, uh, sorry, as the House prepares to vote on House File 13, which does exactly that. I am also excited that they will vote on House File 150, which will provide the emergency funding child care programs need right now to keep our doors open. I have personally seen the positive impact that high quality child care combined with the child care assistance program makes in the lives of the children and families in our state. Over the past two years, we have had four former students who started out at our center as infants and toddlers graduate from high school and return to work at our center. In their interviews, I asked, why do you want to work here? And the response was the same, that this place had made such a huge impact on their life. It made such a huge impact, they wanted to return and provide positive experiences for the next generation of children. These former students turned teachers were all able to attend our center because of the Child Care Assistance Program. We are fortunate to have these young teachers, and unfortunately, we will be lucky if we can keep them. The wages that child care centers can afford to pay teachers are constricted by what parents can afford to pay for care and in what they receive in public funding. This is why bills like House File 13 and 150 are vital to a healthy and sustainable child care system. As educators, our number one job each day is to show every child that they are safe, loved, and valued. Today, we look forward to members of the House showing Minnesota children, families, and providers that they are valued by voting in support of these important bills. Thank you. Yes. So I was scheduled to introduce Amina Adan, a St. Paul parent, to share her story next, but she's unfortunately home. She's unfortunately home with children who are sick, so I am pleased today to instead introduce Asiya um, Ahmed, who is a parent from Minneapolis, to share her story. Thank you, Asiya. Good afternoon. My name is Asia Ahmed. I'm a leader with a count with a kid count on us, and I'm a teacher at the Plymouth Academy. I want to speak to you uh, today as a parent of five children who depends on a child care system program. My children are age four, six, and nine, and 14. Only my oldest child is no longer eligible for child care. Many people do not realize that child care, care for children through age 12 before and after school on the days. 
when there is no school during distant learning in the pandemic, that means every single school day, my four years old goes to Hester for two days and a week. I'm not able to find him another daycare, childcare center for other days, days due to the teacher short, shortage. I, be, I, be, I have been a childcare teacher for five years. The only way I can work is because my children receive childcare through the childcare assistance program or CCAP. I work part time and I'm going to school to learn certificate for child development, Mintuzuri or Mintuzuri teacher trainer. HP HF13 will increase the rates that providers receive a CCAP, which will give childcare center the resource they need to provide high quality childcare. The rent had been way too long, for way too long. Uh, the low rent means that my paycheck as a childcare teacher is also too low. Oh, Childcare teacher need a higher wage to pay their bills and provide for their family, which is why HF13 and the emergency funding HF150 is so important. We need the legislation to continue to work towards funding childcare so it's higher quality for childcare. Truly affordable for every family and long live career for the teachers. I look forward to this bills passing the home house today to move us in the direction. Thank you. I would like, le I would like to introduce Majority Leader Long. Thank you so much. Uh, so it's a big day for child care in front of the Minnesota House today, and it's no accident that this is House File 13, that this is a top priority for our caucus to be able to help fund child care. We know that in Minnesota, child care is incredibly expensive. We have some of the most expensive child care in the country. In fact, our average child care costs are higher than uh, the tuition for in-state at University of Minnesota. Uh, we also know that when people are polled about why uh, they're not going back to work with uh, the pandemic ending and why we have seen such a workforce shortage, that child care is the number one reason cited for why people can't get back to work, the uh, lack of affordable child care. And that's not just in urban districts like mine, that's across the state. That's everywhere in our state where we're having challenges about affordable child care. So when I was dropping off uh, my four-year-old at pre-K this morning, uh, I was thinking quite a bit about the, the bills that we had up today and how much I value her teachers, how wonderful they've been in her life and in my son's life before her. Uh, and we do not pay them enough. We do not value them enough uh, for the incredible work that they're doing to try to help bring our early learners uh, get them ready for a lifelong of learning, get them ready for K-12. So this is a really important first step, and I just want to thank Chair Pinto for how hard he has fought for getting to the 75th percentile for so many years. And with that, I'll uh, turn it over to Speaker Hortman. It is so fun to have the trifecta because it gives us an opportunity to do things that will really meaningfully change people's lives over and over and over again. So here we are again to talk about uh, some more great bills that we will have on the House floor. And they are bills that we uh, know that the Minnesota Senate also supports. And we know that they are bills that the governor will sign into law. So as opposed to talking about what would be great for Minnesota, we are doing what will be great for Minnesota. Um, it's no secret DFLers have really prioritized uh, early education in, um, in our caucus for all the six years that I've been the leader of the caucus. And we know that in Minnesota we're facing two unacceptable opportunity gaps. One is inaccessible and unaffordable child care, and the other is the opportunity gaps that come later in school. And today we're taking action to invest in early care and learning to support families to close those gaps through assistance, through early learning scholarships, and grants for providers. Getting our children off to a great start doesn't just help our state in the short term, it's critical investment for our state's future success. Research shows that the biggest payoff comes in the earliest weeks of life, so making sure that these children have quality early experiences when their brains are just forming those connections will help us close the opportunity gap over the long haul. Also, investing in early care and learning helps our economy because we know so many people are on the sidelines of the workforce, and part of the reason that they're not back in the labor force is because they can't find affordable child care. What we're proposing today is a down payment on a much bigger commitment to uh, our state's youngest uh, Minnesotans. We're looking forward to continuing this work this session with Governor Walls and the Senate DFL. 
And we're together, the, the um, House, the Senate, and the Governor will ensure that Minnesota children and their families have access to affordable, <coughs> high quality, early care and learning. Our children are only young once, and uh, when we think about making investments of things like one-time money versus ongoing money, uh, even if we're only able to, to uh, supercharge some things like early learning, this year you're only four once, mm -hmm. but you carry that progress that you make during the age of three or the age of four the rest of your life. And so these investments are among the most important we can make with the state's projected budget surplus. So with that, we are happy to take questions. Could you explain how the 75th percentile works in is that the maximum allowable by the feds? Or yeah, so it's a, it's a little bit, um, can be a little bit confusing. Uh, the, the rate is based on a survey that's done of providers. So it's not actually 75% of something, it's the 75th percentile in a survey. And the reason that the feds, uh, federal government says that this is the standard is that it allows families sort of a, a, a wide array of choice and options in their community because there's a whole bunch of different providers that they can choose from. Um, our rates were at one point so low that we actually were in danger of having to pay a penalty to the federal government because they were so low. Um, we've raised them a little bit. They're at the 30th percentile for uh, preschoolers and at the 40th percentile for infants and toddlers. Uh, that's much better than we used to be, and that's still quite low if you think about that market survey. Um, so the 75th percentile gets us up to where, the, where we are supposed to have been kind of all this time. So, so is a lot of this money going to pay for children who are already enrolled and just helping those centers who are serving this, this community? Or is there, are there a number of new spots being opened and if so, can you kind of yeah, sure. Um, so uh, it's it's both those things and all those things. So first of all, in the combination of bills, one thing that's ha one thing that's happening is that we're getting families off the sidelines right now. So HF 150 is about before July 1, we get 40 million dollars out in early learning scholarships right away to get kids and families the care and learning that they need. There's also that piece about the monthly payments I, I referenced to providers. Regarding CCAP, though, um, part of it is increasing rates. Oh, thank you. That's okay. Thank you so much. Hello. I should have mentioned, by the way, we were scheduled to have much younger kids, but it turns out this is during nap time. <laughs> it's actually true. And so there we go. Um, so, uh, so then regarding CCAP, um, part of it is that providers are getting increased, uh, increased funding for kids they're caring for, but part of it is as providers get better rates, they're more willing to take families on. And part of the bill is a reprioritization in uh, how counties um, uh, take families off the waiting list and how that gets funded. Uh, it's a little bit wonky, but essentially what it means is that it gives the counties confidence that because once they take a family on, they have to continue providing care and learning for them. So what's built into the bill is the counties having additional confidence to have more families being served. So can, All those pieces. Yeah, so it's, it's, I mentioned the HF 150, it's easier. It's about 4,000 families it should be. Um, it's harder to say regarding the other piece. Um, at this point, I have got information about, about kind of the amount that some of the rates will go up. Uh, in Ramsey County, my county would go up between 30 and $70, depending on the age of the child and the setting. Um, but as far as the additional number of families, that's going to be a little bit challenging to, I've been trying to work with counties to calculate, and it's been a little bit challenging. But there will be more, more counties being able to be helped. Are you talking thousands, tens of thousands? I, I think, yeah, yeah no, no, fair enough. I mean, I think not in the tens of thousands range, I wouldn't think, regarding, uh, regarding that reportization piece. Um, but, but and, and as the speaker alluded to, this is something that we're doing early in session. We want to get these rates increased as, as soon as possible to get support to families and recognizing that, that they and counties have been waiting for, for years, and providers have been waiting for years. But our full budget, of course, is, is yet to come. Um, so yeah, it's um, it's probably my guess is probably more in the thousands range, but um, but I'll try to work on that, Brian, and get back to you too. Can you talk about this in the broader picture of child care? I know um, majority leader long you talked about the early start child tax credit. Forgive me if I got the name wrong, um, but just some other pieces that will likely come up in this 
conversation? Yeah, I think it's first it's important just to recognize that, uh, again, this sector was in crisis for long before. Um, we made a decision in the 1800s that brain development started at age five, and what it means is that we spend ten times as much when a child turns five. So we've got a situation right now where you've got um, this really fragmented, deeply underfunded system in every different way that we have it. So uh, you know, you're gonna, you've seen us in past years, and I would think continuing to, to advance investments in early learning scholarships like we are here in child care assistance. We want to make sure that kids have the opportunity to be in preschool in their school districts, a lot of options. And also, yeah, there is a, a Great Start tax credit um, that uh, that's, that uh, has been uh, proposed uh, by our caucus. Uh, the governor has a dependent care tax credit, provides support to families in that way as well. So this is a this is a problem that is you know has a very long history, and we're going to have to come at it from a number of different angles. If uh, committee needs any indication, I'm sure we're going to hear a lot today about fraud and fraud prevention. Um, what what do you say to those folks out there who think that these programs are particularly vulnerable to? Yeah, I mean, um, often folks are referencing a legislative auditor report that at this point is coming up on four years old. Um, in response to that, in 2019, um, our caucus led the way in putting a lot of program integrity measures into place. Um, I remember that we had a series of hearings about those measures and got strong bipartisan support saying, wow, these are really working really, really well. Um, and so, you know, Folks are going to say what they say, um, but the fact is that um, we have a program where the measures in place um, have been really doing a lot of good. And let's face it, the biggest threat to the integrity of this program is how deeply underfunded it is. I think we have time for one more. Yeah. Thanks for your time. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. Appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you.